Hello everyone, welcome to this video. This time we are going to talk about switch capacitor converters. This is an introductory video to this type of converters and first we will see an introduction, then we will present the voltage follower switch capacitor converter, we will analyze this converter, then we will present a design example and finally we will show some simulation results. Please note that in this presentation we will be using components available from the library control.lib which is available from my website and for more information please take a look at this series in which we show how to create a Simulink compatible control library. To understand the basic behavior of a SCC converter, we need to revisit the exchange of charge between two capacitors. Here on the left we can see two capacitors C1 and C2. The capacitance of C1 is C and the capacitance of C2 is N times C. And they are charged with these voltages and these charges. V1, Q1 and V2, Q2 and at a given instant we are closing the switch S. So we are going to have a situation that, like this in which both capacitances are in parallel and they are going to have the same voltage V. The charges uh, of each capacitor is going to be Q1 prime and Q2 prime. So our objective here is to obtain this final voltage V. For this we know that the uh, charge in any system is an invariant. So the charge at the beginning Q1 plus Q2 is equal to the charge at the end after closing the switch. So Q1 prime plus Q2 prime. We know that the, initially the charges are C times V1 plus C, I'm sorry, N times C times V2. And this has to be equal to the total charge that we have in this circuit on the left. So this is the total capacitance, the parallel capacitance times the voltage V. And the parallel capacitance, we know that it is the addition of both capacitances C plus NC. So from this equation, we finally obtain this expression here in which we have the final voltage as a function of the initial voltage of each uh, capacitor and also as a function of the ratio between both capacitances. So in order to understand this better, let's see a couple of examples here. Imagine that the initial voltage of capacitor C1 is VO, and capacitor C2 is this charge, so its voltage is equal to zero, and they have the same capacitance. So after closing the switch, we are going to have this voltage across both capacitors, 1 over 2, the initial voltage VO. Let's see this other situation in which capacitor 1 has this voltage VO1, capacitor 2 has the voltage VO2, and capacitor 2 is 9 times the capacitor or has nine times the capacitance of C1. So the total voltage at the end after closing the switch is going to be like this. is one tenth the voltage of capacitor C1 plus nine tenth the voltage of capacitor C2. So we can see that each capacitor is going to contribute to the final voltage in a proportion which is equal to the ratio of its capacitance divided by the total capacitance of the system. Let's study our system a little bit further from the point of view of the energy. So if we study or calculate the energy of our system before closing the switch, we can get this expression here, which is the energy of each capacitor added together. And if we calculate the energy of the system after closing the switch, 
the final energy is going to be like this, which is the energy of the parallel combination of both capacitances. Using the expressions before, we can get this expression here. And it can be demonstrated that this expression here, the final energy in the final system, is going to be always smaller than the initial energy that we have before closing the switch. We can do a quick example here. For example, if the voltage across capacitor C1 is VO, the capacitor C2 is discharged and they have the same capacitance, then the initial energy is this value here. However, because we have calculated before, the voltage at the end is going to be half of the initial voltage. So the final energy that we have in our system after closing the switch is half of the initial energy. And this is quite shocking because if we look at our system, we can see that we have not dissipative elements like resistances in our system. We only have capacitors and capacitors are considered as reactive elements that ideally they are not going to dissipate any losses. So the question is what is going on here? The solution to this conundrum can be obtained by considering the real circuit in which we are going to have always a series resistance because we know that the capacitor is never ideal, it's going to have some series resistance, also the switch is not ideal and we also are going to have some series resistance. So all these resistances are going to add together, so we are going to have a total series resistance in our circuit, Rs. So when we are closing the switch, we are going to have a situation like this, in which the current that is circulating in the circuit is going to have a peak and then um, exponential evolution until reaching the value zero. The peak current is given by this expression here, the difference of the voltages uh, across both capacitors divided by the total series resistance in our system. So it is unavoidable that we are going to have some losses in our system and these losses are going to be dissipated in the series resistances that we have in our circuit. These losses can be calculated by using, of course, this expression here that gives the energy that is going to be dissipated during the process. What is really curious here is that the energy that we are going to have dissipated in this circuit is independent of the series resistance. If we have a very small resistance, then this peak is going to be very high, but the time constant here is going to be very small and it is going to reach zero very quickly. If the series resistance is higher, then the peak is going to be smaller, but it's going to take more time to get zero due to the higher a time constant. So at the end, the losses keep constant. And this occurs even in the ideal situation in which we can have a um, zero series resistance. In this case, what we are going to have is a very high peak in the current, ideally tending to infinite, during a very short time period. In this evolution, we can calculate the power as an infinite current squared times zero resistance. And this is indeterminate. And this indetermination can be solved, as we have seen in previous slides, by the difference of the energy before closing the switch and after closing the switch. So now we can see a first circuit, the voltage follower switch capacitor converter, which is the simplest one. So in this case, we have one switch capacitor here, capacitor C, and two switches S1 and S2. Then we have the output capacitor, CO, and the load resistance. 
Here at the bottom, we have the signals to drive both switches. During a given time interval, T on, the switch S1 is closed and the switch S2 is open. Then we have a small dead time between both uh, the activation of both switches and then we turn on switch 2 during a given time T on. And then we have another dead time and then we continue like this. In the simplest operation mode, which is the one that we are considering here, we are supposing that this T on time of the switches is long enough so the capacitors are going to be charged and discharged completely. To study the operation of the voltage follower, let's consider first the circuit with no load, as shown here in this slide. So in the first interval, we are closing a switch S1, and then we are going to charge capacitor C up to the voltage VI. So we are going to have a current pulse here like this, and capacitor C is going to be charged up to VI. Then in the second interval, interval phi 2, we are closing switch 2. So we are exchanging or sending charge from capacitor C to the output capacitor. So we are going to have another current pulse here. So the output capacitor is going to increase its voltage a little bit each time we close switch S2. This is the same process that we have seen in previous slides. So the evolution in each interval is going to be like this. Every time we perform a complete cycle, the output voltage is increasing a little bit, in the next cycle a little bit, and so on, until reaching the same value at the output as at the input uh, voltage. Let's see this very quickly with an um, LT spice simulation. Here we have our circuit. The input voltage is 12 volts. We have the capacitor C1 of 10 microfarads and capacitor C2 of 90 microfarads. And it is operating uh, with no load. The operating frequency is 100 kHz and T on times are 4 microseconds. So let's run the simulation and then we can see the output voltage so that we can see how the output voltage is increasing until reaching the final value of 12 volts. If we show for example in another pane the current that is circulating through C1 then we can see in these current peaks during the charging and discharging process of capacitor C1 and similarly we can measure the current through capacitor C2 so we can see also how the uh, charge is going from capacitor C1 to capacitor C2. Let's see for example the value here in the first interval at this point. Note that we have selected here capacitor C1 10 micros, capacitor C2 90 micros. So, in total, the capacitance is 100 microfarads. So, we know that capacitor C1 is going to contribute to one-tenth, as we have seen before in this situation, and this capacitor is going to contribute with nine-tenths of its voltage. At the beginning, capacitor C1 has 12 volts. So one tenth of 12 volts is 1.2 volts and capacitor C2 is totally discharged, so it's not contributing. So this value here has to be 1.2 volts. Okay, so we can see here the value it corresponds to what we have calculated before. And then we can follow in this way and calculate other values if we want. When the output voltage reaches the final value equal to the input voltage, around 12 volts, then we don't have almost any current uh, change because capacitor C1 is charged up to 12 volts and capacitor C2 is with the same voltage, so there is no current circulating between them. Now let's see what happens when we connect a load resistance at the output of our converter. So in this case, we are interested in knowing what is the value of the current circulating uh, 
through the output and also the voltage that we are going to have at the output. For this, we have to consider the conservation of the charge in any system. In this case, we can see that when we close switch S1, the charge that is going to be stored in capacitor C is or can be calculated like this, is going to be C times VI. Then in the next interval, we are closing switch S2. And then we are going to send a charge from C to CO. We know that at the end, in this process, the final voltage is going to be equal to VO. So the charge that, we, that remains in capacitor C is going to be QC prime equal to C times VO, which is always lower than the uh, initial charge, of course. So at the end, the difference in the charge is going to the output in the form of current. So we can see that the difference in the charge of capacitor C1 times the frequency is equal to the average current through the output. Because we know that at the end, the average current through any capacitor is equal to zero, so the average current through capacitor CO is zero. So from this equation, we can operate substituting the value of delta Q with uh, the difference of this uh, QC and QC prime. I'm substituting and then we obtain this final expression. The output voltage, the average output voltage is going to be equal to the input voltage minus one over F times C times the average current IO. So then we can see that this is going to have, or this is a factor which has the units of resistance. So we can call this the equivalent resistance of our switch capacitor C, 1 over the frequency times the capacitance C. And then this is the equation that, the, that we get to express the behavior of our converter. The output voltage is going to be equal to the input voltage minus the equivalent resistance times the average current. So now we can draw the average model of our converter. Our switch capacitor converter can be modeled by using this average circuit here in which we have the input voltage, the equivalent resistance of the switch capacitor C, which is 1 over Fc. Then we have the output capacitor and then the load resistance. So from this, we can analyze our circuit and obtain the output voltage as a function of the input voltage, the equivalent resistance and the load resistance. We can calculate the losses that we are going to have in our circuit due to the losses in the switch capacitor. And finally, we can get the expression of the efficiency. Note that here we are only considering the losses due to the exchange of charge in capacitor C, so we are neglecting the switching losses. However, the switching losses can have an important effect on the efficiency and we will see this later. So at the end we are going to have a behavior of the output voltage as a function of the output current as shown here in this characteristic. Ideally we will have the uh, output voltage equivalent to the input voltage but when we connect the load at the output then we are going to have an um, output voltage that is lower than the input voltage. Is a, the, the response is a straight line as this with a slope which is equivalent to minus the equivalent resistance. As we have seen, VO is going to be equal to VI minus RE times IO. We are also interested in calculating the output voltage ripple that we are going to have in our converter.
For this, we can consider the charge that is coming into capacitor CO and the charge that is coming out from the, this capacitor. We know that in any capacitor operating at steady state, the average current is going to be zero. So the charge coming into the capacitor is going to be equal to the charge coming out from the capacitor. We can consider first this interval here in which we are sending charge from capacitor C to capacitor CO. In this interval, we can neglect the output current because the current coming from capacitor C to capacitor CO is going to be much bigger. So we can approximate that the charge that is coming into capacitor CO during this interval is approximately the charge that comes from capacitor C. So the charge entering into capacitor CO is going to be approximately equal to the charge that comes from capacitor C, which as we have seen before is CVI minus CVO. So from this we can obtain the uh, increase in the voltage in our capacitor, output capacitor CO, as 1 over CO times this charge. And uh, in this expression, we, as we have seen before, VO minus VO can be expressed as the output current times the equivalent resistance, which has this value here, 1 over Fc. So operating in this expression here, we can finally obtain this equation in which the peak-to-peak -peak output voltage ripple that we are going to have is equal to the average current divided by the frequency and the output capacitance CO. At the end, if we consider the other situation, the charge that is coming out from the capacitor CO, we can see that this interval in which we are charging, sending charge to capacitor CO, is very short compared with the total switching period. So we can consider that the output current is coming out from capacitor CO almost during the complete switching period. And calculating this charge that is coming out from the capacitor in this way, we will obtain the same expression for this peak-to-peak -peak voltage ripple. Now we can see a design sample. Here we have selected a switching frequency of 100 kHz and the capacitance of our switch capacitor is 10 microfarads. So the equivalent resistance of the switch capacitor is going to be equal to 1 ohm. The input voltage is 12 volts and the output capacitor is 90 microfarads and the uh, load resistance is 10 ohm. So with the equation that we have seen before, we can obtain the DC output voltage equal to 10.9 volts. The output current is going to be approximately 1.1 amperes and the output power around 12 watts. So the losses are going to be around 1.2 watts and the efficiency that we are going to expect is around 91%. We can also calculate the peak-to-peak -peak voltage ripple that we are going to have at the output using the expression that we have just seen and we obtain 121 millivolts. So as we have seen also, we can draw our average circuit which is going to be like this in this case. And this circuit is going to provide not only the DC values for the output voltage and the output current, but also gives information related to the dynamic of our circuit. For example, we can see that we have the equivalent resistance, the capacitance, the capacitance and the low resistance. So the evolution of the output voltage during the startup is going to be an exponential evolution like this one. The time constant of the circuit uh, would be given by would be given sorry by this expression here the uh, resistance, the equivalent resistance in parallel with the low resistance times the output capacitance. Approximately this is equal to the equivalent resistance of the switch capacitor times the output capacitance and is going to be around 90 microseconds. So we can see that we will obtain steady state 
approximately in five times this tau constant, which is going to be around 450 microseconds. So let's do now a quick simulation of our circuit to check that everything is correct. Here we have the input voltage of 12 volts. We are using these two switches with an um, on resistance of 10 million. The switching frequency is 100 kilohertz and the on times are uh, 4.8 microseconds. So now we can run the simulation and see the output voltage. So we can see how the average value of the output voltage follows this um, exponential evolution as we have seen. And we are reaching a steady state around this point here uh, for 450 microseconds as we have seen. We can also check uh, the uh, output voltage ripple here, if we look at this voltage, so we can measure the voltage ripple like this, going from this point to this point approximately. So we can see that the uh, ripple is here is 110 millivolts, very similar to the value that we have just calculated. Now let's do a simulation operating in a steady state so we can check the losses and the efficiency of our converter. We have included here these statements to calculate the uh, values of the currents at the input and at the output and also the voltages and the uh, output uh, power and the input power and the efficiency. So now we are going to save only information for from 700 microseconds to 800 microseconds to do the calculations in a steady state. So we are now run and we can see for example the output voltage. So we can see that the steady state uh, voltage is 10.86 volts, very similar to the value that we have seen in our analysis before. And then if I come here to this pane and on the keyboard I press Control L, then we can see the log file. So we can see that the output power is 11.8 watts, the input power is 13.4 watts, and the efficiency is 88%. So this is a little bit lower than the uh, theoretical value that we have calculated. And the reason is that in the theoretical value, we are neglecting the switching losses that we have in the switches. We can see now, for example, also the current in the uh, capacitors, capacitor C1. This will be the current uh, uh, coming into capacitor C1 and coming out from capacitor C1. And also in another pane, maybe, we can see in the current. Uh, uh, the current circulating through capacitor C2. So we can see that the uh, capacitor C2 is receiving this current here from capacitor C1 when capacitor C1 is discharging. A very interesting feature of switch capacitor converters is that they are bidirectional. So now uh, I can take, uh, for example, the voltage source from the input to the output and the load from the output to the input and I don't have to do anything else. The converter is going to send energy in the other direction. Let's see in this. I'm going to take this here and I'm going to move both the resistance at the output capacitor to the input and reduce the connections. So I'm going to draw here we could keep even the capacitors at the input and at the output in parallel with the voltage source because it's not going to have any impact in fact we, we usually use capacitors also at the input to decrease uh, reports and do some filtering so now as we can see we have the uh, voltage source at the output and the load at the input. So we can run the simulation and see that now the voltage 
and the input is increasing until reaching the value of a steady state in a similar way. So this is very interesting because with this converter, in principle, we can get energy from uh, uh, from an energy source. It could be a solar panel, for example, and charging a battery that we have at the output. And in the other situation, we can take the energy from the output and then sending it back at the input at which we can disconnect the solar panel and connect the load that is required. Of course, note that in order to make our converter bidirectional, we need to use here at the, for the switches, we need to use bidirectional switches so we can control the current flow in both directions. One of the problems that we can find in switch capacitor converters is the high peak currents that we are going to have through the switches, especially during the startup transient. For example, in this converter, if we run the simulation and then we look at the current circulating through switch 1, we can see that at the beginning we, ca we have very high peak current through the switch. This is because the capacitor the switch capacitor is completely discharged, so we are charging it uh, from zero, and then the peak current is very high. As we can see here, and they can reach even 1000 amperes because also the uh, series resistance of the switches that I have selected here are very small. Then when we reach steady state, the peaks are smaller because capacitor C1 has a higher voltage and then the current circulating is going to be lower. So we need to take special care during the startup transient so the peak currents are not going to be too high so we are going to have a failure in our switches. So for this, we have several possibilities. One possibility is not to select so very good switches with a so very low series resistance. If for example, we select here switches with 100 ohm resistance and run the simulation again, then we can see that the peak currents are going to be more reasonable around 100 amperes here we can see also the current through switch s2 so it's going to be similar and in a steady state the values are also more reasonable around 12 amperes and remember that by using a higher series resistance here we are not increasing the losses of our converters that at the end depend on the uh, series equivalent series resistance of the switch capacitor. A uh, second possibility to decrease the startup current is to use some additional circuitry so we can charge capacitor C1 and capacitor C2 at the beginning through a series resistance so then they are not going to start uh, from the beginning with a very low value and therefore we can decrease these peak currents during a start up. And uh, finally a third possibility is to do a start up of this input voltage so we are not going to apply directly 12 volts to our converter but what we can do is to increase slowly this uh, voltage so the startup currents are going to be also lower. Let's do a quick simulation of this. Here now we are using um, a pulse voltage source in which we are going to increase um, slowly the voltage at the input so that we can implement the soft start. So let's run the simulation and see for example the input voltage. We can see how the input voltage is increasing slowly until reaching 12 volts. The output voltage, of course, is going to take more time to reach steady state, but on the other hand, we can see how the current through the switches is going to be much more under control. Here, the maximum value of the peak current is below 36 ampere. We can also see the current through the other switch, 
and then we can see how the currents are much lower than in the case that we apply directly the full input voltage to our converter. Well, this is all today in this introduction to switch capacitor converters. We will see more topologies of switch capacitor converters in future videos. Please let me know if you have any comment or question. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you in the next video. Goodbye now.